Master, Wardens, Your Excellencies, my Lords, Aldermen, Sheriff, Chief Commoner, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it gives me genuine pleasure to be asked to deliver this 25th Tacitus Lecture to you. Uh, like Tacitus, I'm by training a historian, originally, and his life of Agricola, Tacitus described a town that he called Londinium, with which you'll be familiar, uh, as London, as a, quotes, town of the highest repute and a busy emporium for trade and traders. And it's with maintaining that very valuable status that I'd like to be concerned in my lecture tonight. Now, to those of you who know me, the title I've chosen for this lecture must have come as a, something of a shock. Uh, you'll probably find it unlikely that I'd sympathize with the Occupy movement because the title of my lecture, as you know, is, is Occupy Right. To declare my position at the outset, I'm a supporter of market economies, small government, and I'm a climate change skeptic. So I'm not really the obvious profile to be a supporter of the Occupy movement. Even if it weren't for my views, uh, taken quite literally, the question I pose with my title could be answered quite simply by saying, how could you know? It's really very difficult to identify a clear, coherent, unified goal for the protest movements which began to receive wide coverage when Occupy Wall Street occupied New York's Zuccotti Park on the 17th of September 2011. Now, I became aware of the Occupy protest early in its life because the, uh, the news and police helicopters started hovering over Zuccotti Park at first light when this protest began, and I have a, an apartment nearby, so my first acquaintance with Occupy only amounted to the fact that they made sure I got into work on time, basically. And, of course, now we have our own branch of Occupy very nearby in St. Paul's Churchyard. Attempts to analyze the protesters' aims, taken literally, seem likely to fail to me. I think I just about understand the point about the so-called 99% and the inequality of wealth. But what's the actual demand behind it? Uh, the protesters, what do they want as a result? Uh, a so-called Robin Hood tax, that's the term that's been used. Some of the protesters seem to confuse uh, even this by talk of a Robin Hood transaction tax. Now, progressive or capital taxation, which is what I take they mean by the Robin Hood element, and a financial transaction tax are quite separate subjects and would have quite separate objects and outcomes. Apart from this lack of a clear goal, I think it's very easy for us to pour scorn on Occupy as a sort of swampy does capital markets or financial markets. Um, it's easy for us to focus on their lack of hygiene in some cases. It's easy to focus on the champagne socialist nature of the protesters who are busy drinking frappuccinos from Starbucks, communicating on iPads, and complaining about inequality. So very, very easy to knock them. Easy, but perhaps not right, would be my suggestion. One of the things that occurred to me about Occupy, because I first became acquainted with it in the United States, where it originated, was that it received very similar treatment from the media to that accorded to the Tea Party movement and to the Republican presidential candidate, Ron Paul. This struck me as un pretty unlikely, given that the, uh, they occupy occupies, op opposing places on the political spectrum in the form of Occupy and Ron, and Ron Paul and the Tea Party. What could they possibly have in common that the media would treat them similarly? Now, I first became interested in Ron Paul prior to the 2008 presidential election. I took one of these very simple online tests, about 20 multiple choice questions, covering your attitudes on a range of, of topics, welfare, Medicaid, foreign policy, gun control, the federal budget deficit. Then after you'd taken the test, it told you which candidate you were closest to and which ca candidate you were furthest away from. Now, there are no prizes for guessing which candidate I was furthest away from. But the man I, I was closest to, according to this test, was a man I'd never heard of, called Ron Paul. So since then, I've, beca I've been rather interested in him. And I've noticed he's come in for vilification rather in the way that Occupy has. Unelectable is one of the kind of media descriptions of Ron Paul in the current presidential candidate selection process for the Republican Party. As I was in New York in January watching the Iowa caucus for the Republican Party in my New York apartment, which is now a lot quieter because Occupy has been moved on by the, by the, the, the forces of law and order, I heard a TV show commentator describe Ron Paul as, quote, mad, unquote. Now, I, not actually heard that type of reference to any other candidate in the, in the campaign, and, and there are several other people who seem to be far more likely to warrant that description, frankly. Similarly, on listening to the media commentary on the Tea Party movement, 
it would be tempting, I think, for the, uh, the, the proverbial man from Mars landing to conclude that they and not Barack Obama is in charge of the executive arm of government and responsible for America's problems and policies at the moment. It seems to me what Occupy, Ron Paul and the Tea Party all have in common is that they challenge the status quo. They challenge that oxymoron, the accepted wisdom. The commentators' approach to Occupy, Ron Paul and the Tea Party are all attempts to play the man, not the ball. Criticising the social background and the personal hygiene of Occupy supporters is an attempt, I think, to deflect attention from the fact they may have a serious point about the way that financial markets have been operated, including those in the City of London in its widest sense, taking in Canary Wharf, Mayfair and St James, where the hedge fund and private equity crowd hang out, basically. So I thought what I'd do tonight is focus on some of those problems, and it's hard to approach that without mentioning first the ills of the banking system. So I'm going to start there, if I may. Um, one of the major points of debate which has emerged from the financial crisis has been whether or not retail banking should be split from investment banking. And governments across the Western world felt the need to save banks from the impact of the credit crisis. I think they correctly judged that not to save banks that were central to the payment system and the process of credit creation would reduce our economies back to trading using cowrie shells. So I think they were correct about that. The great problem, of course, which it gave them, was that the evolution of banking over the last 25 years has led to investment and retail banking becoming inextricably intertwined. So it wasn't possible to save one without saving the other. Now, the process of convergence in investment and retail banking included the repeal, repeal of the Banking Act of 1933, which you'll probably more commonly know as the Glass-Steagall Act, uh, an act which was repealed by a law signed by, ironically, Bill Clinton in 1999. Uh, the Act was already being largely bypassed, but as a result of that bypassing and the, and the repeal of the Act, banks and investment operation, banking operations have been able to rely on the, first of all, implicit, and more recently, eventually, the explicit government guarantee that their retail operations needed. And in, in, in gaining that, they were able to secure funding at much lower rates for their trading operations than would otherwise be the case. Without that implicit and now explicit government guarantee, I would hazard the, case, the guess that the trading operations involved would be rated somewhat closer to triple Z rather than triple A. Now, uh, never mind the analysis in this particular case, it strikes me as more than a coincidence that during the period when we had the Glass-Steagall Act from 1933 until 1999, we didn't have a crisis of the sort which we've had since 2007. And of course, the Glass-Steagall Act was passed in the aftermath of the Great Crash and Depression, events which are very, very similar to those which have occurred to us since 2007. And that doesn't strike me as a coincidence. It's not, therefore, surprising that there should be calls to split banks into their retail and investment banking operations as a result of the crisis. And in the United States, we have the Volcker Rule, named after the former chairman of the Federal Reserve, Paul Volcker, which attempts to prescribe the scope of banks' proprietary trading activities. In the UK, we have the recommendation of the Vickers Commission on Banking, which recommended so-called ring fencing of banks' retail operations from their investment banking operations. Now, I don't wish to criticise the activities or intentions of either Volcker or Vickers. On the contrary, uh, Paul Volcker strikes me as the extant central banker in the world of the greatest integrity. Uh, what I think is that their reform, reforms do not go far enough. Whenever I've heard the term ring fencing in my career, it's always proved to be ineffective as a barrier to disaster. I'll give you some actual examples that I encountered. And the, and the term used was exactly ring fencing, if you look up the reports at the side of the time. In 1987, we were told that TSB, which was in the process of taking over the merchant bank Hill Samuel, was ring-fenced from the, the losses that Hill Samuel might incur in the 1987 stock market crash. It wasn't. In 1990, we were told that a company called British and Commonwealth was ring-fenced from the losses of its computer leasing subsidiary, Atlantic Computers. It wasn't. It went bust. And finally, my final example, is that we were told that the Mirror Group Pension Fund was ring-fenced from the possible depredations of Robert Maxwell, and we know how that went. <laughs> what is needed is the full separation of retail and investment banking. The Volcker Rule is bogged down in the minute side of definition of proprietary trading, 
The Vickers Commission recommendations is very far off from implementation, even of so-called ring fencing, that it will have no impact, certainly for many years, possibly if you take my view of ring fencing at all. What I suggest is quite simply that the United States undoes the repeal of Glass-Steagall and that we implement exactly the same restrictions on this side of the Atlantic. Now, I know that the bankers operating in banks, which may include many of you, which combine retail and investment banking will threaten to leave the UK as a result. Um, what would I say in relation to that? I would say, why would we ever listen to the opinions of people who got things so disastrously wrong and have an axe to grind? Where will they go? Uh, it doesn't strike me that Paris, Frankfurt, or Berlin, or New York look any more banker friendly to me. Um, it would be very nice if instead of threatening to leave, one of them would actually engage in what I'll call for the sake of this speech, the intellectual argument on this subject. I'm leaving strikes me as a, as a playground argument, not something that, uh, that people who are talking about the higher reaches of our economy should be engaging in. Can we have a, can we have a reasoned argument from somebody? It would be nice. And last, and by no means least, if the politicians, regulators, and those of you who are involved in governing our city think what I do, you should have the courage of your convictions. If you conclude that the combination of retail and investment banking has produced nothing but disaster, and if banks who wish to continue to engage in it wish to leave, to be frank, good riddance. Let them become somebody else's problem, because that's what they will become. On the subject of banking, it's clear that securitization also played a major role in the, in the generation of, the, uh, of the, the credit crisis. Now, I last worked in a bank some considerable years ago, and when I did, when you made a loan, both the, the banker and the borrower worried about it for quite a long time about servicing and repayment of the loan. It remained on your books. Of course, all of this changed when securitization was developed. Banks generated loans, but they were on sold to hedge funds, fixed income investors, other banks, with the advent of the credit derivatives markets, banks continued to hold the asset, but on sold the risk of default in, these, in those cases. Now, I wouldn't doubt that those developments originally had a positive impact on the efficiency of banks' balance sheets and the loan markets concerned. But I, every single financial innovation I've ever seen has gone the same way, which is it's taken to extreme. And in this case, it was the advent of structured products in which purchasers were offered assets which should similarly be rated as triple Z, but told that as a result of the structure, they were triple A, and they were helped to understand this by a sort of alphabet soup of acronyms, CDOs, CLOs, CLO squared, etc., etc. Of course, none of that was true. Uh, and the net result was an absolutely disastrous mispricing of risk. Banks generated subprime assets, but they didn't wish to hold themselves, of which they knew that as a result of the low interest rate environment and the so-called dash for trash, the, the search for income, that they could on-sell. In a particularly bizarre twist, some of the banks who generated and sold these toxic assets also bought them back through their trading operations, which is, strikes me as particularly bizarre. It, it, when, I, when I realized that, it reminded me of an old story, um, which some of you will be familiar with, but I hope not too many of you. Um, it's about the oil man who dies and goes to heaven. And, uh, well, he goes to the pearly gates anyway. And when he gets there, St. Peter greets him and, uh, and looks at his charge sheet and says, um, oh, you've led a good life. What, what did you do for a living? He said, well, I was an oil exploration man. And he said, oh, sorry about that. He said, um, we've got too many of those in heaven. God's bored, doesn't want any more. He said, well, what does that mean? He said, well, it means you're going to hell. He said, well, that's not fair. He said, he's God. He doesn't have to do fair. He can do whatever he likes. Mm -hmm. Does that mean you've got lots of my friends in there? So Peter said, well, I should think so, yes. He said, could I go and have a drink with them perhaps before I go to hell? He said, yes, that's okay, you can do that, but no tricks. I mean, you know, we're all powerful and all-knowing up here, obviously, and, you know, if you could be back here in an hour, and then we'll deal with the business of getting you downstairs. So the old man trips off, finds the bar in, uh, in, in heaven where the old men all drink, and, uh, and walks in, and he's greeted by all his friends and say, Fred, God, it's great, you've come to join us, you've, you're in heaven. And he said, no, I'm not staying. He said, why? He said, oil's been discovered in hell. At which, point, <laughs> at which point, all the drinks go down, and all of his friends rush past him, past St. Peter and the pearly gates, and make a beeline for hell. So anyway, he has a drink on his own, and then wanders back to the pearly gates, and there's St. Peter. He says, well, you're a clever one, aren't you? I didn't see that coming, he said. Uh, you can stay in heaven now. The old man says, thanks, but I think I'll go to hell after all. He said, why, because your friends are there. <laughs> <laughs>
He said, no, there might be some truth in the rumor. <laughs> Ironically, uh, one of the things I was told in my broken career is that the easiest person to sell to is a salesman. A and the banks basically believed their own spiel about these products and started buying some of them back. They infected themselves with the same stuff that they'd sold to other people. And, and the severance of the links between lender and borrower, which had existed in banking, and when I was in banking, that severance of that link led to a mispricing of, mi of risk and obviously catastrophic consequences. Um, historically, lenders exercise caution about the eventual repayment and servicing and the viability of the borrower. Securitization didn't only break that link and allowed you to issue mortgages and other loans in the comforting knowledge that if the borrower failed to meet his or her commitments, somebody else would bear the loss. The actu it led to an actual reverse pricing of risk. The assets which were easiest to sell and had the highest returns were those with the worst quality. And so it led to an actual reversing of the normal risk process in terms of pricing, and as a result, the subprime disaster. Securitization should be banned. People should have to hold assets which they generate until maturity. Big bang. Um, I, I owe my presence here tonight to Jack Rigglesworth, who's a, a member of the, of the company, and uh, whom I worked with at W. Greenwell over the period of Big Bang. So I blame you, Jack, for this. Uh, not Big Bang, I mean, uh, I'm going to uh, deliver the lecture, but, uh, and so will others, I'm sure. And there are a number of other faces in the audience that are familiar from, from over that period. 2011 saw the 25th anniversary of Big Bang. Uh, in 1986, uh, as many of you will be familiar with, but some of you won't, the way in which shares were traded and other securities in the UK changed. There were no longer any fixed commissions for share trading, and brokers and market makers were allowed to combine in so-called dual capacity firms. To recap for any of you who were either are too young or weren't present during this, uh, up to the background, shares had been traded before that on the London Stock Exchange in what was literally a mutually owned private members club. That's exactly what it was. The members of that were firms and individuals who ran those firms, owned those firms, who were split into brokers who dealt with investors, charged commissions for doing so, and so-called jobbers or market makers who provided liquidity for dealing and in return were able to try and take the spread between the buying and selling price, the bid offer spread. Prior to Big Bang, those commissions were fixed. All brokers charged the same rate. They didn't compete on price. Investors couldn't shop around and get a better deal on commissions in the way that they can now. But at least the investors had one piece of protection. The broker's relationship with the jobber or market maker was to some degree an adversarial one. The broker was charged with the duty of trying to get the best price obtainable when they did a transaction. Now, it's fair to say that structure made it London increasingly uncompetitive as a venue for share trading, particularly when you compared it with New York, uh, which had had its own version of Big Bang known as May Day because it happened on the 1st of May, 1975, when it scrapped fixed commissions. And trading in large international company shares had begun to migrate to New York because investors could deal more cheaply there on variable commissions. Now, the Big Bang reforms were negotiated being the then Trade Secretary, Cecil Parkinson, and the then Chairman of the London Stock Exchange, Sir Nicholas Goodison. Um, it changed a lot of things. It not only removed fixed commissions, it not only allowed brokers and jobbers to combine, but it also took us for a world in which, basically, we came into work at 9.30, we went home at 4.30, and we managed to fit in a long and quite often liquid lunch in the interim. Now, we've now moved to a world, of course, where people get into work at about 7 a.m. and lunch is something you eat at your desk. And whilst I applaud the work ethic involved, I'd just like to observe that there's been no uh, noticeable improvement in investment returns for investors as a result of this regime. <laughs> Client orders were dealt with by a dealer on the London Stock Exchange floor. Uh, who was communicated with by radio telephone from your offices quite frequently, or by an STX line if you happen to be in these so-called box. Whereas we've moved to a world now where dealing is done at the click of a mouse with a screen, or even generated by a, a, a computer algorithm, not a human being. And the firms dealing in shares before Big Bang were mostly partnerships. Now they're mostly owned by banks. So those were other changes in the way that, uh, that we worked. In my view, at least a large portion of the Big Bang changes were a colossal mistake. The basic motivation for it was correct. Fixed commissions were a barrier to competition. London was losing out as a centre for share trading as a result. 
But Cecil Parkinson and Nicholas Goodison made one massive incorrect assumption. They correctly foresaw that the end of fixed commissions would lead to a radical reduction in commission rates. They then went on to reason that as a result, stockbroking would become unprofitable. And as a result, as a quid pro quo for those negotiable commissions, brokers and jobbers would be allowed to combine. To use the jargon, they would go from being single capacity, either broking or market making, into dual capacity firms. They could do both. I'm afraid the problem with that, apart from all the other problems that have originated from it, is it ignored one of the simple laws of economics, which anyone doing GCSE would, uh, would learn in order to pass the examination, elasticity of demand. They failed to recognise that the reduction in commissions would lead to a massive upsurge in the volume of trading. Uh, you could, and indeed a number of people have, remain profitable as a result of the commissions generated from that. The problem is not just that that assumption was wrong, they introduced insuperable conflicts of interest. You no longer had somebody acting in the interest of the investor as an agent acting to try and get them the best price and the best deal. You are now dealing with integrated firms who maximise their profits, if they could, by offering the worst deal to the client because they were a principal on the other side of the transaction. Those weren't the only conflicts of interest. Once these tectonic plates of the London securities market started to move, the integrated firms took on other activities, merger and acquisition advice, which had been the, the domain of independent merchant banks previously. So you now went to a world in which people were advised on deals by banks which raised the finance, including the equity and bonds and, and debt for deals, did the research on, on the companies concerned and dealt as principal with the, with the clients who wished to actually take part in any of this. The result for, in terms of potential for conflict of interest and profit at the client's expense was, was manifold as a result. Now, as we know, these uh, conflicts, which I think are correctly identified, are policed by so-called Chinese walls. But uh, surely the endless list of scandals on both sides of the Atlantic show you that basically a regulatory concept isn't really actually adequate to deal with greed. It seems inconceivable, I think, to, uh, to maybe all of you, for all I know, certainly to most people I talk to, that the Big Bang reforms will ever be repealed, or at least the part of them which I think have led to the problems. However, I think until at least part of them are, we'll be condemned to the sort of mistakes, malpractices and calamities which are part of the foundation of the financial crisis that we are living through now. I can't really uh, deal with this subject, I think, in the current environment without talking about the bonus culture. Uh, the bonus culture is regarded as one of the factors which contributed to the financial crisis. The poster child, if you, if you like that term, for this is the bank trader who gets paid a cash pay bonus. The calculation of that bonus takes little or no account of the amount of the, cap of the capital of the institution which he puts at risk. Sometimes the outcome in terms of profit or loss on which the bonus is based is on a mark to model rather than a mark to market basis. The model is sometimes populated by data supplied by the trader or one of his colleagues or one of his cronies. Um, and quite often the, the bonus is an upfront payment for a position which matures over sometimes years or even possibly decades in some markets. And that's, I think, a reasonable representation of part of the problem. And I think it's true that bonuses have long since ceased to align the interests of employees and owners of businesses. Quite clearly, apart from all of the preceding problems that I've identified, the downside risks are hardly uh, evenly shared. There was an ex-trader whom I worked with uh, in my past who wanted to come and join my, uh, my previous firm, Colin Stewart, with me, who said to me, I was a bit doubtful about his trading record, to put it mildly. He said to me, don't worry, I'll take the first million pounds of any losses. I said, well, it's not the first million I'm worried about. <laughs> <laughs> Inequality of downside risk sharing. What I disagree with uh, very fundamentally, though, is that the reform of this situation is a matter for government, legislation or regulation. It's a matter for shareholders and it's a matter for owners. Um, if I could risk another quote from, uh, from Tacitus, who I think said something relevant on this subject. He said, the more corrupt the state, the more numerous the laws. If he'd lived in our times, I think he would have added the word regulation to that as well, basically. The attempt to regulate remuneration uh, through the FSA remuneration code has produced and is producing unpleasant and intended consequences. Unintended consequences in some cases I know. I mean, the regulatory bias is that it's wrong to have a large proportion of remuneration which is variable, i.e. bonus. All of that's led is institutions to have to pay higher basic pay in order to remain competitive. It's worth bearing in mind that the FSA's remuneration code 
doesn't apply to anywhere other than London, and that these organisations are competing in other cities with other organisations which are not subject to it in those places, and that they have to accommodate that in a competitive market. It's also led to the point now where banks which are attempting to downsize their operations have got higher fixed costs which they're, they're having to deal with. There's nothing wrong with a very large proportion, preferably I'd like to say as an employer, or of people's remuneration being variable so long as it's variable on something which it's right to vary on, like the realized cash profits of the organization after taking account of the risk and capital that has been taken on. If you can get the entirety of people's uh, remuneration to be variable on that, it's a good thing, because it's the one protection you've got against cyclical downturns. Uh, the, the outcome of this in terms of regulatory uh, in intervention reminds me that Ronald Reagan once said, the most frightening words in the English language, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> it's a matter for the owners of businesses to decide how and how much staff are paid. To be very topical about it, I think the, the interference in the bonus of, uh, of Mr. Stephen Hester, a CEO of Royal Bank of Scotland, is reprehensible. He's been forced by political pressure to forgo a bonus, which was part of a contractual package which was agreed when he became CEO of that bank, when it was already government controlled. Surely the outcome of this is that nobody with Mr. Hester's ability and in their right mind will take on such a job in the future, and we need them to. Nor do I have any great sympathy with the institutional investors who, and proxy voting agencies, some of whom I suspect get involved in the remuneration debate from a political or social engineering point, and who are fixated not on how people are paid, but on the amount which people are paid. On one occasion, one of these institutions, which shall of course remain nameless in the spirit of these things, but which manages pensions in the education sector, <laughs> admitted to my non-executive chairman that they voted against my company's remuneration report without having read it. Uh, in other words, it was a purely doctrinaire decision. It's not an, that's not an exercise of fiduciary duty, which is what I'm seeking from owners here. It's actually an abuse of that in the interest of a political aim. As an investor, and as you remarked at the beginning, I do now run a fund and, and have been the investment advisor on the Talent Fund for many years. I have no interest whatsoever in how much people are paid. I'm interested in how they're paid. If they are paid correctly as chief executives and executives, the more they're paid, the better. I applaud it then, because after all, we as shareholders are, are benefiting from that. Whilst I'm on the subject of pay, I thought I'd talk about another sector of the financial services industry which is heavily represented in, in London, but also elsewhere within the UK in terms of how people are paid, and that's fees in the fund management industry. And I've got probably four points that I'd like to make to you about this. First of all, for the hedge fund uh, portion of that industry, I'm going to leave aside the, the small uh, fact that, uh, that the, the hedge fund industry has, on the whole, failed to deliver on, on its name in terms of providing any kind of effective hedge against any event that I could possibly begin to describe, or its, altern or its alternative label of the absolute return sector. It clearly isn't. So let's leave that aside for a moment and just look at the fee structure, which traditionally has been the infamous 2 and 20. 2% 2 of assets under management, 20% of any gains is the, is the standard structure. Uh, historically of the hedge fund industry. Now, if any of you think that that's a fair way of remunerating people for taking risk in managing your capital, what I'd like to do is have a whip round with you for, uh, for cash, perhaps 100 pounds each, and I do actually pass a casino on the way home. I'll go in I, I, and have a, have a little go at the blackjack table, uh, and if I have any winnings, I'll give you 80% of them in the morning. That seems fair. It's exactly the same model. Um, Clearly, it's not a fair sharing of the, of the upside-downside risk again. The example I always use to illustrate this, and I assure you it's accurate, even though many people at the hedge fund industry will tell you it's not, I have the, the annual reports that I've got it from, the spreadsheet which I compiled, and, and the mass, I'm afraid, is unassailable, is Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway, probably the most famous investor in the world. If you had invested $1,000 in Berkshire Hathaway stock in June 1965, and you'd held it until recently, you would have experienced one of the greatest, if not the greatest, investment performance of all time. It's compounded in value at over 20% per annum, and your stock in Berkshire Hathaway would now be worth about $4.4 million, approximately, 20% compounding. Now, as it's managed at the moment, that's exactly what you would get if you were Berkshire Hathaway. You will hold the shares, Warren holds the shares, he doesn't take any management fees. What if he'd structured himself as a hedge fund charging 2% of assets under management and 20% of any gains. Of that $4.4 million, 
$4 million would now be Warren's and $400,000 would be yours. Now, I don't think anyone is ever going to convince me that that's a fair division of, of the gains for this. So I, have, I would suggest that nobody should be paying performance fees out there. In short, what's happened is hedge fund has now uh, changed. It no longer describes uh, an investment strategy and it even doesn't even design, define an asset class. All it defines is, is a, a remuneration structure and an unsupportable one at that. Now, I can't mention hedge funds without mentioning their first cousins in private equity. Um, again, I'll leave aside the inconvenient fact that quite a lot of studies suggest that private equity funds have actually underperformed quoted equity markets if you were to attribute the same level of leverage to them. And uh, uh, that, so that, I think, is, uh, is something which you do need to focus on this area. But let's just look at the fee structure, because I'm talking about pay here once again. Obviously, this has had a pretty similar fee structure to the, uh, to the hedge fund industry. I note today that one of the big American pension funds, uh, I think it was the New Jersey or, no, Texas Teachers has just given uh, several billion dollars to, uh, to Blackstone to marriage on a, on a uh, actually I think in this case a 1 in 15 fee. But uh, 2 in 20 has been quite common and, and still here you've got 15% of the gains, which obviously I could make exactly the same remarks about uh, as I could make about the hedge fund industry, and I think with the same degree of validity. But there's one extra twist that the private equity industry has managed. The private equity industry measures the returns that it's delivering to you, the ones that I say many studies show underperform the quoted equity market, from the moment it invests in a company, an investee company using the fund, to the moment when it exits. But you as an investor are required to commit to the fund for a long period of time, sometimes up to 10 years. And you have to have funds readily available to put into that fund when they call for them. Um, but they don't include that in the return, even though that earns a very, very low rate of return for you. It's rather like you giving me cash for my fund and not measuring the returns of how my fund does from the moment when we receive your cash. We'll measure it from the moment when I decide to buy some shares with them, shall we? I don't think that's going to catch on as an idea, but, but somehow they've managed to get this uh, a piece of, uh, of ledger demand foisted on people on how to measure these returns. So in that area, I think there's even something additional to criticize. Um, the third thing I'd say on, on the fund management industry and the way in which it's paid is disclosure. Uh, mutual funds in the UK uh, are required to disclose their TER, or their total expense ratio. Now, the problem with that is it's almost exactly the opposite of what it describes in terms of uh, total expense ratio. It's actually a partial expense ratio. Sure, it includes the annual management charge and it includes administration costs, but it excludes the cost of dealing, including stamp duty, from it. Now, to compound that omission, the FSA statistics show that the average mutual fund manager in the UK turns over his or her portfolio somewhere around 80 to 90 percent per annum. Now again, leaving aside the fact that this frenetic activity is not shown to deliver any benefit whatsoever, it does roughly double the charges on the fund. And I would suggest that this approach to disclosure, where you're actually only seeing about half the costs that are applied to your fund disclosed, the nearest analogy I can give to you is it's rather like low-cost airlines where they tell you a price for a ticket, but when you arrive, it doesn't include you being able to take luggage. Um, and by the time you've paid for everything, it's pretty pricey. And that's when you find the pace that you're actually flying to is actually nowhere near the city you're trying to get to. So you, you then have to pay for grand transportation to get you to where it was you were trying to go in the first place. And I think there's a very great similarity in terms of disclosure. What we need here is a consistent and mandatory approach in which the fund management industry is required to disclose all of the costs which are attributable to running a fund. Um, last but by no means least on fund management, platforms. Recent years in the UK have seen fund platforms become the dominant distributors of UK retail funds. Uh, investors use them for, uh, for ease of administration. They keep all their funds in a single place. Um, people will say, I can easily switch between funds. I'd just like to point out once again that all of the evidence shows you that's a mistake in terms of investment performance, but that's what people like them for. Um, and many investors are under the, uh, the mistaken impression that it enables them to get a better deal from the fund manager in terms of fees. Now, if this were to be the case, and I assure you it's not, it would be the first example I've ever come to in my life where the imposition of a new intermediary in a transaction makes it cheaper. I've never seen that. Fund management fees in the UK have justifiably come in for a lot of criticism. One of the reasons they've remained so high is because of the fund platforms. The platforms get their revenue from trail fees that are paid from a proportion of the fund management fee. They therefore have a vested interest in the management fees remaining high enough to pay their trail fees. 
They need to fail tr them to pay enough to cover their own. The fund manager needs to charge enough to cover their own costs and profit margins and those of the platform through the trail. Now, the UK's leading platform describes itself as the Tesco of the fund management industry, which I thought was an interesting point to be able to, uh, to make a comparison for you. Uh, Tesco's margins are a bit under 8%. The UK's leading platform's uh, operating profit margins are over 60%. Spot the difference. Uh, now, that's, for those of you who are arithmetically challenged, a 60% margin means the following. Revenues, 100. Costs, 40. Profit, 60. Okay? That means that they could move to the following model. Revenue, 50. Costs, still 40. Profits, 10. Have a 20% profit margin and have halved what they're charging the investors. Uh, we're not exactly talking about Tesco or Walmart here, are we, in terms of distribution? And those 20% margins that they would be left with are the sort of margins that companies like Nestle and Procter & Gamble, the world's biggest consumer products companies, would die for. There's clearly something wrong in terms of that, uh, in terms of that structure. Uh, and in the same case, the UK's leading platform uh, had its results recently and made the following statement without any apparent sense of irony. Quotes, we will continue to promote our view that bundle models have value for, invest for retail investors well, so that they can continue to be confused by what they're paying. That would be what a really rather good idea. And the, the payment of the trail fee also introduces an insuperable conflict of interest. Will any platform carry on it a fund which refuses to pay trail fee no matter how good its performance? No, they can't do so. Now, this problem is uh, apparently going to be uh, solved by the forthcoming Retail Distribution Review, or RDR, as known by the FSAs. Although, again, I would like to caution you about those wise words of Ronald Reagan about, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. Um, to be effective, what RDR needs to ban, do is to ban payment of all trail fees. No excuses, not it's for administration or it's for an execution-only platform. As soon as you start to bend the principle that the fund manager is allowed to pay a trail, you are setting up another insuperable conflict of interest and the investor will be the loser. Now, the final subject that I'd like to touch upon uh, is, is, I think, a topical one at the moment, and it's uh, the relationship between the city and, uh, and the European Union and, uh, and the Eurozone. Uh, I'd like to say something about that. Um, I mean, probably the first observation I'd like to make is that uh, when we're thinking about this subject, the, you might recall the, the predictions of the various Europhile doomsters who told us that if we didn't join the single currencies, large swathes of the city and indeed British industry as a whole would be weighed laced. Uh, laid waste, sorry, get the rise right, right. Laid waste, weighed laced as well. Um, they were fairly obviously comprehensively wrong about that. In fact, it's almost clear that it was, it was uh, uh, pre the, precisely the opposite of the truth in terms of what the outcome would have been. I would just caution one thing. Why do we keep hearing from these people still? Why are they still fielded as pundits on the television, frankly? I mean, do you keep listening to advisors who lose you money by making mistakes on this scale? I don't. We should have no regard for their views. The Eurozone crisis has revealed quite a lot about the EU's attitude to the financial services industry in general, and the UK, the city, capital, money markets in particular. Um, if you look at it, we've seen Eurozone governments move to ban naked short selling in the form of credit insurance on bonds. So you couldn't actually take out a naked short without actually owning the underlying. So that was their first move in terms of trying to control the credit portion of these markets. Um, when that didn't have the desired result, and the desired result, by the way, was to enable them to continue to borrow the amount of money that they wanted for their social engineering experiments at a rate that they deemed capable of servicing, their move then was to move on to banning short selling. Uh, so you couldn't short sell whether you owned the bonds or you didn't own the bonds. There's even a proposal now to simply ban selling. They're really, you've got them, you've got to hold them to maturity. That's it. Now, I'm, I'm a great believer in, in long-term holdings in fund management, but I do quite like the freedom to think about that I might want to sell something that I own from time to time. Eurozone politicians have railed against the markets which have closed to Eurozone banks and governments, uh, most recently and distinctly probably in the, in the words of Francois Hollande, the French socialist uh, challenger for the presidential, forthcoming presidential election, who said, quotes, my true adversary does not have a name, face or party, he, a bit sexist that I thought, he never puts forward his candidacy, but nonetheless he governs. My true adversary is the world of finance, he said. Monsieur Holland's right. The market is his enemy. That's why it should be our friend. The EU has also introduced proposals for the financial transaction tax, or so-called Tobin tax. Now, proponents of a financial transaction tax, which I might say include Occupy in some of their incarnations, 
might clear to bear in mind a few points. Uh, I'm a fan of James Tobin, as it happens. Uh, I built or helped to build a, a, an analytical system called Quest, which was named after his, uh, his principal invention, the Q ratio, which is the ratio between market value and replacement cost for assets, for which he won his Nobel Prize for economics. He did not win a Nobel Prize for his transaction tax idea, I can assure you. Um, when such a tax was tried in Sweden, 60% of trading in Swedish securities left the country never to return, and, and the tax managed to garner exactly one thirtieth of the amount estimated. And like so many of the, uh, of the, the actions which we, uh, we could talk about here, such as the remuneration code, um, it has unintended consequences, this kind of thing. If a transaction tax is introduced, it would only be effective if it reduced internationally. And by internationally, I mean including New York and Singapore and anywhere else where trading might migrate to. Um, but the very fact that the proposal for such a tax and, and the measures in terms of short selling or even selling have emanated from the EU during the crisis, I think shows that the EU both envies the City of London and fears the free markets in money and capital which operate from here. That they should envy the City of London is, uh, is fairly easy to see, given it's a source of employment and tax revenues and so on. Um, I'm sure that it would be nice to see that that shifted to Frankfurt or Paris if you were uh, obviously closely associated with those countries. But it's not only for the revenues, it's also so that it could be controlled more easily. The free markets in the city are controlled because they are the last thing that hold politicians to account. Because like all people who spend more than their income, they need an outside source of funds. At the beginning of the Clinton administration in the early 1990s, an advisor called James Carville was stunned at the power over the administration of the bond market in terms of dictating policy to it. And he said, I used to think if there was reincarnation, I wanted to come back as the president or the pope or a, a high scoring baseball hitter. He wanted to come back as something powerful or scary. He said, but now I want to come back as the bond market. You can intimidate everybody. <laughs> now, the people of Greece and Italy could no longer hold their politicians to account they didn't elect them. But the free markets can, and we need to keep them free for exactly that reason. Last week, uh, Lucas Papademos, the unelected um, so-called technocrat, what a wonderful term that is, imposed on the Greek people, was commenting on the riots which greeted the, uh, the austerity package uh, which has been proposed as part of the latest Greek bailout. And he said, again, without a single hint of irony, quote, vandalism, violence and destruction have no place in a democratic country and won't be tolerated. tolerated. I completely agree, there's just one problem. It's not a democratic country. You know, he wasn't elected. So, having taken you across a number of subjects there, I think I should probably try and return to my central question. Is Occupy right? Uh, yes, in one sense. There's a great deal that's wrong with the functioning of financial markets. They require radical reform if they're to be fit for purpose again. That's obviously my view from all the things which I've said this evening. But they're wrong in one very important way. We need the markets to be more free, not less free. It's interference with free markets by policies aimed at preventing the business and financial cycle from operating in their natural course, which stored up the problems that we've got. We need to allow the creative destruction of capitalism to take its course, to wash the beach clean, whether it's with failing airlines or car companies or banks or governments. That has to happen. It's part of the natural process of the cycle. Finally, what I would say, I think, is Occupy is wrong to blame bankers. For some reason, they always light upon the word bankers. Fortunately, not brokers or fund managers for this crisis. To be sure, there's no shortage of stupid, greedy bankers, traders, brokers around to blame. But all that those people did was supply a means for all of us, individually and collectively, through our governments, to live beyond our means. So blaming the individuals who were basically the tools which supplied this will not solve our problems. I think we collectively are all to blame and we all have a responsibility to reform this and put it right. Thank you.